Okay, I'll call the meeting to order. Good evening, everybody. We're opening the public hearing for tonight. My name is Richard Stewart, and on behalf of Coconut City Council, I'd like to welcome everyone here. This is a public hearing into the bylaws that will be introduced to you in a moment by our city clerk. Council for the City of Coquitlam has given first reading to these bylaws and has directed that a public hearing be held uh, in order to get the opinion of members of the public. Staff from the City's Planning and Development Department will present a summary of each proposed bylaw, after which the floor will be opened to anyone in attendance that wishes to present his or her views on the proposed bylaw. We've got, uh, for one of the items, we have some pre-registered speakers. They'll be given the first chance, and then we'll open the floor. I stress to you all that this is a public hearing. It's an opportunity for anyone who has a view on the proposed bylaws to make that view known to council members. Council members are here with an open mind, and they're here to listen to your input. No one here has prejudged the outcome of these applications. But we, council has asked me to enforce some rules associated with this. First off, it's not a question and answer period. It's not an opportunity to debate the merits of the proposed bylaw with council members or with staff or with those in the audience who might have a different perspective on the proposed bylaws. So we ask that you restrict your comments to the proposed bylaw, that you be as brief and concise as possible. We're asking speakers to respect a five minute time limit in order that everyone who wishes to speak is able to do so. Speakers are permitted to speak more than once, only if they have some new good stuff. I ask that the audience be respectful of each speaker and allow that speaker to make his or her point without interruption. And to that end, we find it most helpful if people refrain from clapping, from booing, from cheering, from jeering, any of the presentations made tonight. As chair of this hearing, I have been asked by council to conclude any presentation that does not relate to the bylaw that becomes abusive or which becomes repetitive of views that the speaker has already made known to council members. Please note that if you wish, if you have some written comments that you want to be part of the per permanent record for tonight's meeting, you must submit those to the de clerk's desk here prior to the adjournment of that item. After the adjournment of an item, council can receive no further information uh, on that item until the item is resolved, either by rejection or by fourth and final reading. Uh, immediately following adjournment of the public hearing tonight, we'll have a regular council meeting in order that Council may give consideration to items on the public hearing agenda and to several other items on the uh, City Council agenda. However, if during the public hearing Council requests further information related to an item uh, or otherwise requests that, uh, that consideration of the item be deferred pending receipt of the requested information or for any other reason. I'll now call on, oops, one other, one other glitch tonight. We have an electronic difficulty with the big screen. The big screen that none of us can see because it's right behind us here, but it's helpful for you. So we've got a small screen. So any of you that are like me, 55 and older, you may want to move a little bit closer to the screen or something. Feel free to move in this direction if you want to see what, what is on the screen uh, during the presentations. Okay, I'll now call on Mr. Gilbert to introduce the bylaws on tonight's agenda and the planning and development staff to make a presentation on the first item. Thank you, Your Worship. The first item uh, pertains to the industrial zones consolidation. These are bylaws 4522 um, and bylaw number 4527. Uh, Ms. Tiffany is here to introduce these two bylaws to you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. These proposed amendments to the official community plan and the zoning bylaw represent the final stage of a two-stage project to consolidate the city's existing nine industrial zones into three new zones. The three new zones are M1 General Industrial, which would permit all types of industrial uses and a limited number of commercial uses which support industrial activities. M2, industrial business, which would permit most types of industrial uses enclosed within a building. And B1, business enterprise, which would also permit most types of industrial uses enclosed within a building. 
as well as supporting commercial uses including restaurants and grocery stores of a limited size, office uses, and commercial recreation uses. In assigning these new zones to all the city's approximately 345 existing M zone properties, staff applied to the extent feasible a best fit approach, which included criteria such as current uses of the site, adjacent land uses, existing official community plan land use designation. This approach minimized the number of sites with legally non-conforming uses, but as a result, not all sites were reassigned one of the new zones. Approximately 15 sites are proposed to be rezoned to CS1 service commercial and approximately six sites to A3 agricultural and resource given their location in a resource designated area under the OCP. As a result of these new zones and proposed rezoning, several OCP amendments are also recommended. These generally include adding new policies to outline the intent and areas of application for these new zones, creation of a new land use designation, business enterprise, to correspond with the new B1 business zone, and to replace this existing, uh, to replace the existing highway retail industrial land use designation with this new designation. And then finally, to redesignate properties currently designated highway retail industrial to business enterprise and the newly rezoned CS1 properties to service commercial. Staff are also recommending the addition of several new definitions in the zoning bylaw pertaining to uses and types of uses to assist in the interpretation and improve administration of these new zones. As a result, staff are recommending all final readings to OCP bylaw number 4552 and all final readings to zoning amendment bylaw 4527. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? Are there any speakers to this item? In the third and final time, are there any speakers to this item? You seemed very convincing, Ms. Tiffany. Councillor Hodge. Yeah, just, uh, I just had one, uh, one question on the industrial zones here. And on, in Schedule C, uh, that's attached here, um, I just want to raise the concern about medical marijuana grow operations. And um, I know that formerly they were allowed in, in only one zone, uh, I think it was M3, which was very restrictive. There weren't, there weren't a lot of M3 zones. And I'm just wondering, this just came up when we talked about sort of going from nine zones down to three, um, if, uh, if that was going to sort of open that uh, those zone up for, for more potential uh, locations for medical marijuana grow ops. Although I do notice here that there may be some restrictions within the zone. I just wonder maybe you could just explain that, make sure we're covered off on that. Yes, through your worship, um, you're correct, Councillor. The previous zone for this use was the M3, and there were a limited number of sites that had this zoning. Um, what we are proposing to do is essentially take the same conditions of use that applied to this mar medical marijuana dispensary under the M3 and also apply it now to the new M2 industrial business zone. So it would be the conditions of use would be it can be the only use on the site and has to be federally licensed. There's one additional condition that we are adding as opposed to the very point that you're bringing up, which is, is that there are more sites that will be zoned M2 versus the previous M3. So we're adding on a condition of use. It's a, it's a siting, it's a limited, um, uh, how do I put it? A siting restriction. So within, no site can be located within 300 meters of a site that's zoned for residential schools or park. So what this does, it essentially limits down the potential sites to approximately six sites that meet that criteria, but only one site currently, and actually it's not even one site, but there's six sites that meet that limiting distance criteria, but all those sites currently have uses on them. So if somebody wanted to proceed, they would have to remove all those existing uses on one of those six sites. 
Because my recollection was when we made the change originally after that debate about three years ago, when we identified an appropriate zone, there were a, a limited number of spots that it could be, and, and by nature where M3 was, it wasn't within, you know, close to a residential. So even though the new zones will be, the limitations here are sufficient that we won't see an increase in the number of potential locations then. That is correct. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do it one last time. Are there any final speakers to this item? Any at all? None? Mr. Clerk, I'll declare this item closed. Thank you, Your Worship. Item 2 is an application to amend the zoning bylaw in order to rezone the property at 826 Dogwood Street from RT1 two family residential to RT3 triplex and quadruplex residential. This is bylaw number 4556. Okay. Okay. This site is located on the west side of Dogwood Street, north of Como Lake Avenue in the Burquitlam neighborhood. The site and the immediate area around the site is designated neighborhood attached residential under the city's official community plan. Zoning and on the site and in the immediate area around the site is RT1, two-family residential. The applicant is requesting rezoning to, from the RT1 to the RT3 triplex and quadruplex residential zone to facilitate the development of a quadruplex residential development. The proposed RT3 zone is in concurrence with this OCP land use designation of neighborhood attached residential. Staff are recommending second and third readings to bylaw number 4556. Okay, on this we have one registered speaker, Jeff Chalissery. looks like the applicant. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. My name is Jeff Charles Harry with Casmia Projects. I'm the owner of the property. Uh, most of the details about the development was okay. mentioned. I'll just get your, your address for the record is 4808 Chesham Avenue in Burnaby. Yes. Thank you. Most of the details about the development was mentioned in the letter that was submitted, but I wanted to go over some of the main items. Uh, the subject property meets the guidelines for the Housing Choices Program. The development is located approximately 550 meters from the future Burke Quitlam Skytrain Station. We had an option to subdivide the property into two lots uh, with two larger homes with an additional two carriage homes for a total of four families on the property. The proposed development will still have four families but is slightly a different configuration. The homes proposed are modest in size and provides an additional housing choice for Coquitlam residents. These homes are ideal for those that are looking to downsize small families or first-time home buyers that want the conveniences of single-family living at a cost considerably less than traditional single-family homes in the area. It also provides another option for these that or for those that do not want to move into large townhouse or apartment complexes with underground parking. <laughs> the parking requirement for the RT3 developments is one and a half parking spaces per unit which for this development would be a total of six. For this four unit development, we have exceeded the guideline and have provided seven parking spaces. Entrances and maneuverability within the driveway courtyard were studied at length and the proposed was deemed to be the most optimal as adding an additional parking stall would negatively impact the functionality of the courtyard. A full maneuvering study was completed and submitted to transportation engineering to confirm sufficient space was given. A variety of vehicle types were used to confirm maneuverability of the interior driveway. Uh, based off of the market data and close proximity to public transit, the six, uh, or the one and a half parking spaces or six total for this development would be sufficient. To make sure that adequate parking was provided, we exceeded the guideline and provided seven spaces. Sufficient private outdoor amenity space was also provided for each unit. The required amount is about uh, 37 square meters per unit. We provided 60.3 square meters for unit one. 84.8 square meters for unit number two, 83.7 square meters for unit number three, and 61.3 square meters for unit number four. Most, if not all, the hard services or hard surfaces are also being done with permeable pavers. Standard offsite improvements along the property frontage will be completed. Additionally, community amenity donation or CACs will be made for this development. High quality materials will be used throughout the project. 
hardy plank siding, low E windows, high efficiency plumbing and lighting fixtures, permeable, permeable uh, pavers and others. The proposed development is a great example of the TDS as the home's fifth area and would offer prospective residents brand new modest sized homes that provide most of the conveniences of a single family home at a significantly lower cost. The development's close proximity to the future SkyTrain station makes it an ideal location for these types of homes. Thanks. Any questions? We've got Councillor Asmundson. Uh, through to Mr. McIntyre, just a, a, a comment that was made by a proponent about having two houses with carriage houses, but you couldn't put carriage houses because there's no laneway access off the back of this. And this is a fourplex, but you couldn't use carriage housing in this. There's no laneway here. Mr. McIntyre. Yeah, um, I believe that's correct. Let me just check the zoning on that. Just give me a second, please. Uh, ah, Ms. Tiffany. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, in answer to the councillor's question, accessory suites, which is, what, which is what a carriage house is, would not be permitted in a tri triplex or quadruplex development. These types of uses are only permitted when there's a single family zone or single family use. I think the question was, the proponent had suggested that as an alternative to, the, to this zoning, he could uh, build two single family homes with two car carriage homes. Yes. That's correct. He could subdivide with his 20 meter wide lot. You could subdivide to create two 10 meter wide lots, each with a single family dwelling. But in this case, because there's no lane. That's my point. You, you couldn't do it. You cannot do a carriage house. That's what I thought. You, but right. you can, you could do a secondary suite. That's correct. You can put it, and all single family houses are allowed a secondary suite. Correct. Correct. Not, not in the fourplex, but if it was subdivided into two separate single-family houses, you could have a suite in each house. That's what I thought. I just want to get clarification. Thank you very much. Yeah, the clarification is on this property, there could be four units in two buildings yep. or four units in four buildings. From my understanding, if there is no lane, if you have a minimum width of 70, I think it's 79 and a bit feet, then you can actually still have the uh, two homes with the garage homes based off of the housing choices guide. We've got a bunch of raised eyebrows here, and I think you, it's your 12 worship, meters each. Your, your Worship, uh, yeah, it's in the RT1 zone. It's the two-family residential. It was explained if it's subdivided. Um, <clears throat> there is the carriage house and a garden cottage. I believe the garden cottage is possible without the lane access, as long as you meet the, the, the lot sizes. Tell you what we'll do. We'll accept that there, will be four, there could be four units on this house, on this property, not necessarily in four separate buildings, and we'll stop there because okay. you're not proposing that, you're proposing this. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, that's it. Yep. Councillor Zerillo. Thank you. I had a question for you. Um, um, you mentioned these are significantly lower cost. Yep. What do we anticipate, or you have some numbers in your mind then? We're what expecting about uh, 675 to 700. Okay. As opposed to uh, what those two single family homes are probably looking at 1.1 to 1.2. Okay, that was my question, and then I had one for staff. Is this the time to do that? Through the chair. Um, so is there basements in these homes? Is there a possibility of sweeting out these homes where we would have eight uh, units? Ms. Through, Tiffany. Through, through your worship, two of the buildings will have basements, but there will be no suites within the basements. Access to the basements will be from within the unit. So no exterior staircase. Correct. Okay. But there's still the opportunity that someone could lock it off or there's a basement. There's two basements. You could lock off the basement, but you wouldn't be able to get into it. Well, you could come in through. Yeah. It, if I may, it wouldn't be a legal suite. You have to have access separately outside externally. So inter it's only internal access to the suite. Totally, totally understand. Through the principal yeah. unit. Okay. So you'd have to go totally through the understand. Living, living space of the unit upstairs in yeah. order to get to it. Okay. Totally understand. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? Just please come forward.
So we'll just ask everyone to give your to pull the microphone down to about their okay, chin okay. and give your um, name and address for the record. My name is Jackie uh, Yao. I live in the uh, neighborhood just uh, next to the um, Bill Pro address. We are 10, uh, uh, 828. Yeah, 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 and 28, just next to the door. We didn't register the, because uh, well, our English is not good. My, our neighbors, they are uh, Koreans, they don't speak very good English, so we don't expect uh, um, to speak here. But now I see if we don't speak anything, our voice cannot be heard because the whole community is uh, just a single home and a duplex for the whole uh, Dagwood Street or even the other neighborhood, no duplex or... Uh, Wait, you live in a duplex right next door? No, no. So that's why we feel our... We, when we heard the news, we were very shocked because the whole neighborhood, no duplex, uh, triplex or uh, not even say quadruplex, just single home and uh, um, duplex. So it's a very quiet uh, neighborhood. So all of a sudden, this is... No, applications will build a quadruplex in, in the middle of the community. We feel our, our interests are affected uh, significantly. That's my opinion. If my neighbor maybe want to speak more. Okay, thank you. Okay, just, just to be clear, I have one question. Mm -hmm. You live just north of the subject building. Uh, next. You, you live in? 828. 828 yeah. in the duplex. Duplex, yeah. You live in the duplex. Duplex. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so there is a duplex in the neighborhood and you live in it. The okay. whole neighborhood is just duplex or a single house. All of a sudden it's a uh, quadruplex. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, it's, you can feel our feelings about the, the, the yeah. project. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Please just just come forward. Welcome. Honorable Mayor and Council Member, this is my first time. 630 Morrison Avenue. 630 Morrison Avenue. <clears throat> um, my family, three to one, voted no for this project, so um, I'm the minority. Um, um, we are afraid that uh, we've shared the same concern that maybe the dynamic of the community may be changed. And that um, at the corner of Morrison and Como Lake, no, um, what's it, North Row, right? Clark. North Row and uh, Morrison. Clark. Clark, yes, okay. that's right. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. Um, Clark and um, Morrison, there's a uh, there's a florist, there's a, a salon, there is a, a photo studio over there. Um, unofficially, I've been told that that area has been a um, very um, colorful uh, uh, area that uh, has been uh, not very nice people has been hanging out and then police have done a lot of uh, uh, clean up. So it's been, it's been got much improved when we moved in three years ago. And uh, we share the same concern that the dynamic of the community may be once again be, uh, being a shake up again, and uh, we just have that kind of anxiety, not to, not 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 sure uh, what's going to happen. Uh, secondly, uh, the noise level. My kids is very small, and we have a number of uh, uh, small kids around the neighborhood. Um, it's just a very unique uh, stage of, of, of our um, the family dynamics, and a couple of elderly couples right beside our home. So uh, I just want to see the construction is a quadruplex or tri triple, tri triplet, triplet. Um, what is the time frame of the construction period is going to be, and what is uh, any um, any things that they would be doing to minimize the noise uh, interrupt interruption uh, around the neighborhood? Um, that there's uh, another concern, and I think that's pretty, ah, the price, yes, the price was uh, 600 something dollars. Uh, the square footage, well, what's that square footage going to be for the 600 something dollars? I just want to see. No, I think there were less than that. How, the square footage of these units? What was the proposed 600 something thousand dollars? I thought they were in the 50s. 
through, through your worship, if I may answer that question, the proposed square footage for each one of these units ranges in size from 1,986 square feet down to 1,470 square feet with the other two units in between. Okay, so from? 1,800 to 1,400. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? Please step forward. Anybody else? Any other speakers to this item? Please step forward. Good evening, my name is Kathy Scardillo and I live at 6237 Sperling Avenue in Burnaby. We own property in that area as well. And with the SkyTrain coming in and everything else, um, I think it's a good move to be doing and looking at these kind of things and upgrading because everything else is going that way there and we all have to be prepared for the changes. And that's all I have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? A third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? My name is Hewana. I live in 828 Dogger Street. Sorry, you could repeat, please. We live in 828. 828. Yes. Um, pretty much our, our points has been brought up about overpopulation. And another thing, we, other concern that has been brought up within my family was uh, parking spaces. We don't know um, what kind of dynamic of the family has uh, will be in the units. So we don't know how many cars will be um, we don't know how many cars will be parked and anything, and there's pretty much conflict has been brought up within my family that there's not much of the space for the parking. And and the point that has been brought up by the other guy was the noise level. level. So in order to have four detached dwelling within the one de designated property, well, there's most likely to be the more population will be leaving that property. So there's gonna be more people and there's gonna be higher level of um, noise will be um, resorted. That's all I can say. So we are not happy about those new proposed <laughs> applicants. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just gonna it brought to my attention there were a couple of questions asked by the gentleman who lives on Morrison at 630 Morrison uh, about the construction timeline and about mitigating the social impacts of construction and I wondered if staff had any uh, uh, response related to the timeline of construction which I gather is about six months and the social impacts of construction and our process to mitigate those. Ms. Tiffany. Thank you, Worship. With respect to construction timeline, I think that's really most likely going to be at the discretion of the applicant in terms of his timing. Should council approve the rezoning and the development, and we should proceed with the development permit, the amount of time it takes for him to complete a building permit, um, our processing times for a building permit application for these is roughly around six, seven months. So from there, I honestly can't answer, maybe the applicant can answer exactly how long it will take for him to complete construction of a project of this nature. Yeah. And, it, and it, well, sir, you, you certainly wanted to offer that answer, thanks. Yeah. It should take us about uh, six to eight months to finish that type of a, a project. It's not too big in scale. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Your Worship, if I could, just on second. Mr. McIntyre. Your question, thank you, sir. Um, around the construction impacts, um, I guess Council's aware we've been, um, it's kind of an evolving area right now, and it's been more focused on some of the larger projects, particularly in Burquitlam. Um, that's not to say that something like this, where it's, uh, um, if the project was to be supported and was to proceed, um, it would um, be a change in the neighborhood, there would be impact, and it's the sort of thing we would be. Uh, open to discussing with the applicant um, to make sure that uh, 
those impacts are anticipated, they're planned for, and they're mitigated through the construction period. And there's, there, there is a, a means of doing that. Thank you. Councillor Mars. Thank you. Um, just to clarify uh, Ms. Tiffany's uh, response to the last question, the, the time frame for the issuance of a building permit would be six to seven months or six to seven weeks? Uh, that was six, to, six to eight months. Six to eight months response. was the month. It was once. I, I assume because I, I, that's what I heard. <laughs> Mr. McIntyre. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I heard too. No, I, I think that was uh, um, misdescribed. Uh, um, the, the building permit issuance for, for single family right now is running around four, four to five weeks, which is higher than we'd like to be. Um, this is a little more complicated project that there's four units uh, with a lot of site servicing. So uh, I think it would be more analogous or similar to a, um, uh, a quadruplex or a, I think a small townhouse type of uh, processing, but not in the range of six to eight months. That would be the construction period, not the building permit issuance period. So there would be approximate time period then, so single family appreciating uh, four to five weeks for something of this nature then? Yes, often, typically that would be the yardstick we'd use. We're trying to get those numbers down for single family building permits. Again, I would just note that this is a little bit more complicated. You've got four units going on to a large lot with the site servicing and frontage works. So it's a little more to it, I would suggest, than a typical large house in that area. So the, the question from uh, our resident at 630 Morrison had to do with the disruption period that they, that they would experience. and. Can you share with them the disruption that one might expect during the, the permit application process versus the actual construction process, perhaps, so we can clarify what they might see in their neighborhood? Usually during the, the, uh, the building permit application process, it's not just a, a building permit for the four, the four units are proposed, yeah. it would also be the, the site servicing works as well. During that period of time, the, the, the property sits there, if there's a, I believe there's a dwelling on it, it would be... Uh, left in that situation to all the approvals are in place um, <clears throat> and at that point uh, there would be demolition and, and, and site preparation and then moving into the servicing and then the construction. And that full period between demolition through servicing construction and, 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 and finishing works landscaping could be six, eight, ten months depending on, on the, the weather and, and the uh, developers, contractors and their ability to get work done in a timely basis, but uh, it would be over that sort of duration. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Zerillo. That's fine, thank you. I'm, it's resolved. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? I'll declare this item closed. Thank you, Your Worship. The next item, item three, is an application to amend the zoning bylaw in order to rezone the property at 1243 Wellington Street from RS2 One Family Suburban Residential to RS3 One Family Residential and P5 Special Park. This is bylaw number 4533. Good evening again. This site is located on the east side of Wellington Street, south of Mason Avenue in northeast Coquitlam. The western portion of the site is designated large single family under the city's official community plan and the eastern portion of the site is designated parks and recreation. Zoning on the site. <clears throat> Zoning on the site and to the south is RS2, one family suburban residential. Zoning to the north, RS3, one family residential and P5 special park. To the west is Green Mount Park within the city of Port Coquitlam. The applicant is requesting rezoning to R3, RS3, one family residential and P5 special park to facilitate subdivision of seven single family residential lots on the western portion of the site and a streamside protection area on the eastern portion of the site. The proposed zones are in concurrence with the OCP land use designations of large single family and parks and recreation. Staff are recommending all final readings to bylaw number 4533. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item?
Mayor and Council. My name is Pam Mize. I'm co-owner of the property at 3282 Wellington Court, directly north of this um, location. So this comes as no surprise to the neighborhood, obviously, when the previous owner of the property sold, we knew that this is probably a reality. So this isn't a not in my backyard sort of situation. I just have a few concerns that the information that I've read so far, and I, I probably um, came ill prepared and, and was expecting that we would see more of a, a plan of what was expected. So I thought my questions would be answered based on that. So I just have a few questions that I want to ask. Um, based on where our property is and our house, uh, the front of our house faces north, the proposal for the, the layout that um, I saw on the website today is for the um, two properties to face, um, for the new subdivision to face west to face out onto Wellington Street, which means the side of that top house will then be directly against our back fence. I ex would expect that there's probably some minimum requirements as far as how close to our back fence that that house could be, um, but I haven't seen any information about that. The positioning of the houses, the size of the houses, the height of the houses. Um, as well, our back fence currently is uh, just a, a short three or four foot chain link fence. We've never needed anything else. It's a rural area. It's fine. And the, you can understand that the neighborhood is going to be significantly different with these properties, you know, right behind us and especially for myself and my neighbor with the side of a house, maybe just a sidewalk width behind our back fence. And I just wondered um, what the requirements are by the city as far as fencing, you know, for the um, development of what they would have to provide there to provide us with at least some kind of buffer. But um, right now we have nothing for behind us for that property and the following properties. So it's going to be significantly different. So I just have a concern there. As well, looking okay. at well, on the... I think I know what the answer will be, but I'll, I'll ask uh, staff to get an answer on that. that there's a couple of questions there. The uh, proximity of the house uh, in the side yard, that's the house facing Mount Wellington on the side yard to A, and, um, and the fence issue. Through, yes, thank you. Um, the interior side lot setback for RS3 zone is 1.8 meters. In terms of fencing, um, the property owner is allowed to have a fence height um, from, the, from the back front face of their house, so not in the front yard, but from the back front face of their house going all the way back to the rear property line. They're allowed to have a fence height of approximately six feet. Um, in the front, it's, um, I think it's, what is it, three feet? Four feet, I believe. Yep. So, so there is a higher fence height for the, the, the side of the house all the way to the rear property line. Yeah, and the, require, the question was, is there a requirement for a fence? And no, there is permission for a fence of certain heights, but there would be no requirement for a fence. So they don't have to put a fence between the side of their house and the back of our property? No, there, there would be no requirement for a fence, for you to have a fence or for them to have a fence. Okay. Uh, if I may, Your Worship, no. because yeah. this is a subdivision application as well, um, we can direct the applicant as part of the subdivision application to either place a fence or some kind of landscaping screen along that property line. And if I may... Um, Mr. Johansson. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, there is fencing as a part of this, uh, this project, uh, not only for the environmental area, but uh, we'll ensure that there's fencing along the north property line as well uh, to the standard uh, that's prescribed in the zone. And that's something that the approving officer looks at and, and the uh, development servicing manager looks at as well. And both uh, the houses that will be uh, just south of you there that are fronting onto Wellington, uh, their front entries and driveways will be uh, facing west. Okay. Um. The trees, uh, right now there's, I don't even know how high they are, really high trees on that property. And I have kind of a twofold concern of the trees being gone for, again, for privacy, for shade, for everything else, but coupled with a concern that if only some of the trees are gone, when we have the storms and the high winds, I have a concern that the remaining, you know, few trees may end up on my roof. Um, so I just wondered what the requirement or the proposal is for the trees on that site. Are they all coming down or are they 
Mr. Johansson. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, what I can say in general is that there was an uh, arborist that is retained by the uh, the applicant, and there's also a qualified environmental professional that there's going to be a large uh, P5 special park area. Uh, so uh, that'll be those trees in there will obviously uh, uh, be retained and uh, to ensure that they're wind firm and, and um, to ensure that there's not going to be issues with uh, the trees falling down. And we'll also be reviewing that as a part of uh, the approving officer will be taking a final look at that uh, as we uh, approve the subdivision if the uh, rezoning is granted. And is there any requirement for where the trees are removed for the new lots that are going for there to be any kind of replanting of trees for some trees in the neighborhood that it's not just going to be bare in houses? To whoever that goes to. Through your worship. <laughs> Typically not unless through the through the arborist report there are significant trees that have been identified that are worth saving we do to the extent that we can through the subdivision process to try to save those significant trees as part of the as part of the uh, subdivision review one of the one of the challenges here is that because there's ultimately a building permit that is it's a building permit that's required it's not a development permit that's required for these single family dwellings it's very hard to condition specific a, a, a large number of trees so only certain number of trees if they're identified as being significant we would identify through that subdivision process as a condition to for retention okay the size of the lots themselves um, size and shape of the lots um, just comparing it to Canterbury Lane, if anybody's been to Canterbury Lane, they're what I refer to as postage stamp lots that are full of house. And when I look at, again, from the, the um, city website, um, it was part of a document, and this is attachment number three, whatever page that is, it shows those Canterbury Lane lots and, you know, directly to lots above the new proposed lots. I don't understand the layout and the shape of the lots and how narrow they are at the front of the lot, which leads me to be concerned also that the houses on those lots are going to be have to be positioned well to the back of the lot because they're so narrow at the front of the lot, which is again going to directly impact the houses on Wellington Court that back onto it because now those houses are going to be built very close to the back fences of those lots. What's the minimum requirements for that? Yeah, well, it would be different from the side yard that you were referring to earlier. Mm -hmm. And so I'll go to staff. I believe it's six meters, but I'll. Yes, uh, very insightful comments. Um, this is uh, an interesting uh, subdivision. It's, it's similar to uh, uh, the one that was developed to the south, and it's uh, sort of the, f the first half of a possible uh, full cul de sac, as, as you can see there. Um, because of the. Uh, the nature of the environmental area coming down the back and um, the tightness of the frontage there. Uh, the houses will be situated further back uh, from the front lot line. There will be the driveways coming to the cul-de-sac, but all the houses will be situated within uh, the front and the rear setbacks and also within the environmental setback. It's just that there's the, uh, the, the proposed variance for the side yard setbacks at 1.2 meters, which is consistent with uh, some of our other single family zones for smaller homes. Sorry, 1.2 meters is for where? I'm sorry? Sorry, what did you just say, 1.2 meters? That's for the, the side yards. So f between their two? Yes, between, between the four houses there in the cul-de-sac. So from, from the side of their house to the side of their property line is a minimum correct. of yeah. 1.2 meters? Yep. Yeah. Okay, and from the back of their house to the back of the property line, what's the minimum there? There's an environmental setback, and I believe the uh, re rear yard setback is, uh, just a moment, 7.6 meters. The rear, rear setback is 7.6 meters? That's correct. Okay. So at a minimum, they would be 7.6 meters away from the back? That's correct. Okay. Um, what are the proposed square footage um, and height of the houses? Um, there, there Sorry, are, he seems to be answering all my questions. So. I know. They're, they're, <laughs> I, I, I suspect the houses aren't designed yet, and this is only to yeah. the zoning and the 
the subdivision, essentially. So, so if they're not designed, is there consideration for the houses that they're going to back onto as far as, you know, privacy and space sort of thing, as far as how high those new houses will be able to be? There are, okay, I'll go to staff. Mr. McIntyre. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, a number of good, uh, insightful questions. Uh, I just want to go back and clarify on, on the tree piece. Um, um, in northeast Coquitlam, there's actual tree replanting requirements, and that would apply on, on this parcel here. Three, is it? Yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, the, it's interesting, though, that um, this proposed subdivision is going to the RS3 zoning as are some of the others around. So it's, it's the same setbacks, you know, side yard setback, front yard setback, and rear yard setbacks. And, and the house designs would, well, the specifications for the house designs would be the same. That is, you know, maximum height and, 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 and the size and that. Um, what's a little more challenging with this site here, and as Carl's described, there, the, um, <clears throat> there's the, uh, uh, the SPIA, uh, at the back, at the uh, east side of the property from uh, Hyde Creek, uh, and it, it, it takes up roughly a, a third or half of the property, so it, it's kind of squeezed the, the remaining lot. And um, they've come up with a, a pretty uh, uh, innovative design that, uh, in terms of, of, of the lot layout, so it's not quite the same as I think in, in yours or the, the other subdivision I've gone before, which may seem to be more conventional uh, lot layouts, but they do meet the, the, uh, the bylaw requirements in terms of house placement. They have to prove out building envelopes to the staff before we would bring this, this subdivision application forward to council, so it would be very similar. In, in terms of the, of the tree question, again, um, I think as Carl's mentioning, the, the uh, applicant uh, has retained an arborist to look at the trees on site, what need to be re removed, uh, what are safe to retain, and if there's trees along a common property line that you have concern about, um, I'm sure they could have a look at that because they don't want to be doing work on their side of the property line that, that, that uh, damages or jeopardizes trees you know, that may create a, a safety hazard on the other side of the property line too. So often they will work very closely with neighbors to make sure that they don't create those unsafe situations. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. The, the only, my only other comment is um, in our area, Northeast Coquitlam, and you can appreciate with Hyde Creek, there's a wildlife population there. I'm not thrilled about the bears. I don't mind looking at the deer. But they all live there too, and that property specifically is their pathway from Hyde Creek and across and into the forest across the street. So um, I don't know what can be done, but I just didn't know if there was any consideration that had been given for that of what's going to happen and how that's going to impact the neighbors as well. That if that pathway is no longer there, how those animals are going to be getting through and how much of an impact that's going to be to the rest of the neighbors too just for safety purposes. So just something to consider. Don't you say anything else? Okay. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? Councilor Zerillo. I just had a question for staff about uh, potential development various variance permits for these lots. So I believe something came up a few months ago where um, there was some request for development variance permits to allow the houses to be farther back from the curb because of similar shaped lots like this. I think the bylaw says that the house needs to be, sorry, not from the curb, from the frontage. There's a bylaw that says that, that the house must start a certain uh, a distance from the frontage and will these ones need that same development variance permit that allows them to be positioned back and does the staff have confidence that there is various floor plans or floor prints that could happen here or is are we really stuck with with the location being in one spot in all of these lots to Joanne. yes your worship uh, through to councillor Zerillo um, yes excellent uh, Comments, uh, in terms of uh, the setbacks from the front yard, uh, they meet, uh, all these uh, lots will meet that. Uh, it's a minimum of 7.6 meters uh, from the front lot line. Uh, so all the, uh, the houses will be situated uh, a minimum of 7.6 meters uh, from the front uh, lot line. 
and it's um, what was referenced before uh, are for those four lots that are furthest east, the irregularly shaped lots uh, at the end of the cul-de-sac. Um, because of the narrowness of the front end of those lots, uh, the houses need to be uh, pushed back a little bit and um, there's a, a footprint uh, that uh, the lot designer uh, uses, uh, but it's about 100 square meters for the house footprint and that gets situated within those setback lines. So it's more than 7.6 meters from the front, more than 7.6 meters from the back, but in the case of those four, uh, because of the narrowness of the lots, uh, they're looking or they're proposing a 1.2 meter uh, side yard setback. So it would be 2.4 between the houses instead of uh, uh, 1.8 meters uh, between the, the house side of the house and the side uh, lot, or 3.6 meters. And that 2.4 meter distance between the homes is consistent with uh, the RS7 uh, lots that are also used in Northeast Coquitlam. So it's not a, a departure from uh, what's being developed up there to date. So does that mean we will or will not see development variance permits which with each of the, I guess we won't even see that, is it, right? If, if council uh, gives us uh, advances at the fourth reading, uh, we'll bring forward a separate report outlining uh, DVP application for those four lots. Okay, so there will be DVP for the four? Yes. Okay, and um, I would just, uh, yeah, that's great, thanks. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Um, what's happening to the property to the immediate south of this subdivision? Yes, through your worship, Councillor Reed. Just flipping to attachment three. Now the lot layout and uh, the the road uh, allows for uh, the completion uh, if the if and when the south property owner uh, would like to come in and develop their land. There's an OCB designation of one family on it, which allows single family homes. Uh, so the approving officer has anticipated that uh, possibility in the future. So um, it is possible to get uh, six to seven, uh, maybe more lots uh, on that south uh, property. And that would involve uh, completion of, of the cul-de-sac. Providing so that that person wants to do six correct. or seven lots. Yeah, and in the meantime, uh, the road that's being proposed there uh, will adequately service uh, the proposed development with a, a six meter uh, paved surface uh, between a cul-de-sac and Wellington. So that allows two-way traffic. So my next question is, I do not like going into a subdivision like this with all these variances, especially in lot width in a situation like this. So. Uh, wouldn't it have been better just to go for six lots and not seven when you're going two feet, two meters off each lot? Through your worship, uh, the, the development variance permit is a second step at the applicant's request. Um, the proposed development could work under the, under the proposed zoning RS3 under six lot provision. And we've got seven here, right? The, the seven lots are only a possibility if should council approve the variance for the interior side yard setback from 1.8 to 1.2. Otherwise, the scenario would be a six lot subdivision. Which makes far more sense to me. Thank you. On that question, um, it seems to me the owners could get together and figure out that uh, six and a half lot scenario and I don't know whether that's a possibility, uh, whether that would in fact avoid any of the uh, variances that are envisioned here because I have similar difficulties with the, the, the variances and the anomalies on the lot shape and uh, putting the two uh, landowners in the same room and producing 13 lots might be the only way to, to uh, reasonably maximize their, their return. I don't, I'm, I'm having difficulty with seven here, so. Are there any other speakers to this? Well, apart from you, are there any other speakers? <laughs> I forgot you were there. <laughs> I said one minute, didn't I? I said one minute, okay. It's, it's Minutes fine. up, go ahead. It's fine. 
Um, your worship and council members. My name is Janet Dobrzanski. I'm at the um, property at 3286 Wellington Court. Um, so, so I'm lot B. I'm lot B. Okay. So I've enjoyed living there since 1996. So we knew this day would come, that it would be developed, and we're prepared for that. Once again, just wanting to speak to a couple of issues with regards to the trees. Um, I know that there's been an arborist report. I would love to be able to see the arborist report, um, what their recommendations are. From my understanding, um, the arborist report, he can put forth or she can put forth recommendations. However, it's not up to the developer to necessarily follow those recommendations. How does that work? Miss Tiffany, no, Mr. Joanns, <laughs> no, Mr. McIntyre. There's three choices. Do you want to speak? <laughs> I'm sorry, worshiper. Uh, we're not as coordinated as we could be tonight. Um, typically, um, we look to a specialist, uh, such as an arborist, to, to give us a, a, uh, an assessment with recommendations, because that's the way you um, determine if there's a risk factor there and, and how that can be mitigated. Um, the, the um, my understanding is that where the, the arborist makes a recommendation, it, it needs to be followed. Um, otherwise, you know, someone's making a decision that, that could put uh, uh, something at risk. So, um, <clears throat> again, the I, I haven't worked directly with this file, but uh, I'm sure they've looked at the property closely, particularly along the, the forested edge they want to retain along the uh, the High Creek uh, corridor. Uh, but again, if there's trees along a common property line, if they're clearing up to a property line, they'll want to make sure the work they do on their side of the property is not jeopardizing trees on the north side. So um, again, it's a, a council's direction, but uh, uh, if there's an interest in this application going forward, we would follow up with the applicant on that to make sure that those, those necessary steps are taken. Yeah, just, just to further to your comment, just there are some trees that are along the shared line between the north and south area there where they have, they're significantly impactful on, um, for example, my property and likewise to the new development in how they would build a home with that 7.2 meter setback as far as, I can't remember the number, but with roots, whatever, when you're building a foundation, I can't see how that would fly. So I was just kind of curious, is it possible for us to get the Arborist report, is that like something that happens or? Yep. If I may, Your Worship, yes, it is possible for if the, if the resident would like to come to City Hall or we, I can give you contact information, I'll be more than happy to make that Arborist report available for you to review. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and, um, if, and if I may, oh. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. But yes, with, with that arborist report, we they, they have given recommendations of which trees are suitable to retain, and also the impacts on uh, foundations to uh, adjacent roots and that sort of thing. Um, I don't have the uh, the actual detailed tree plan with me, uh, but I know that um, the trees that are in the existing or in the proposed setback for the lots that are fronting Wellington are adjacent to your back lot line, uh, so they would be outside of the building envelope. Uh, but we'll take a close look at the trees uh, if you come in and uh, yeah. we'll share that with you and we'll take a close look at that and we'll take that under advisement as it proceeds for sure. Okay. Um, I had one other item just with regards to this property. Um, over the years, Wellington Street in itself is not, it's, um, it's a very narrow two-way road. <laughs> um, and with the development of Canterbury Lane, uh, We've had what we've noticed here and then just further south down Wellington. It's not an uncommon practice for us to have vehicles parked on either side of Wellington Street. It's now made it a single lane road on a very dark road that's also um, transit. Um, so that's currently what's happening with Canterbury Lane and then we have 
it opens back up again to two lanes and then what I'm anticipating is that it's going to narrow back down. Um, it's a poorly lit <laughs> uh, road. I'm, I'm just wondering, are there, is there anything moving forward where the, the road is going to be widened? I know it's shared between Port Coquitlam and Coquitlam, so it adds a whole new piece to this. We would have to cooperate with Port Coquitlam. Mr. And cooperation is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Johansson. <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, Perhaps already wider. Exactly. I was there uh, today myself taking a look around. And uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, especially when you look at it on Google Earth, it, it tends to look quite narrow And when you're driving up the road. Um, there will be uh, probably three new street lights uh, put in as a part of this, uh, one on Wellington and a few in the cul-de-sac. Um, so that will be part of the, the servicing. And I'm sorry, I, I don't think I heard you correctly. Could you uh, repeat yourself? Yes, with the, uh, if the subdivision pr proceeds, the rezoning proceeds uh -huh. with the servicing, um, it would be in terms of the street lights, it would be similar to uh, the Canterbury Lane, uh, where there's two street lights in a cul de sac and one on Wellington. And uh, there's also going to be frontage improvements where uh, the sidewalk will be continued. There'll be a, a curb line that'll be brought uh, further east to, to widen the road and allow for some on street parking. And uh, I did consult with our transportation staff before the public hearing, and uh, the, the width will be about eight and a half meters with the option for parking on our side. Now the other side, as the mayor pointed out, is Port Coquitlam. It's a, it's a park. Right. Uh, there's a rollover curb and uh, probably don't want to park in the shoulder too much. Uh, it might fall away on you, but uh, do. there are streetscape improvements uh, and a, a modest widening uh, okay. for Wellington as a okay. part of this. All right. Thank you. We, we do require the installation of street lights when a development on an adjacent property, we require the developer to pay for street lights and curbs and gutters, that sort of thing. It, when I heard it, I processed stoplights. <laughs> and I was going, yes. I don't think I'm understanding you completely, which is why I asked for clarification. The, the so no, stoplights will only activate when the new train crossing goes across there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a train up there before. <laughs> Are there? Are there any? Yes, please, step forward and save me. <laughs> Your Worship, Council, good evening. I want to second everything that everyone has said about this area. It is going to be a great You're loss. going to have to give your name and address first. Pardon? Your, your name and your address. Speak, up. Speak down. Your name and your address, please. Mrs. Morrison, Okay. and, and I live in number one on the cul-de-sac, 3281 Wellington Court. Perfect. Okay. We've noticed a big difference since Canterbury Lane, just, just south of us, was developed. And first of all, I'd like to mention that if this proceeds, I hope that there'll be enough on-property parking so that it'll eliminate all the extra parking on Wellington Street. It's getting quite congested, and that sometimes if parking is on both sides of the street, it could be difficult for emergency vehicles to get through. Secondly, which is really important, is this property um, to be developed is a mainstream thoroughfare for the deer, the bear, and even sometimes the police come through there with their dogs in training. So uh, it's, I can't, can't express enough how much all of us who live in Wellington Court are going to lose. And it's not just the parking or the animals. We've lived in a wonderful spot and I hate to give it up. <laughs> anyway, that, that's really, it's nice to wake in the morning to look out the window or even open the front door and there's deer nibbling on our bush right there. And they're, they're very tame. They, you know, my great granddaughter just loves to sit stand. She takes pictures of them all the time. And they're on their way from Hyde Creek to Coquitlam River and back again. 
And that's basically I wanted to say thank you for listening to me. Good night. Thank you. Councillor Zerillo. I had a question for the speaker about the parking. Um, I, I've got a question about the on-street parking. Um, it was mentioned at the speaker before as well. So there's, it's been mentioned twice that there's on-street parking happening on both sides of Wellington. Yes. I'm just wondering where is that traffic coming from? Is it going to the people going to the park, or is it people that live close by? Well, the traffic that that's on the street to park is from people who live there, somewhere between, um, not from. Uh, um, Wellington Court because we seem to have enough parking, but it's Canterbury Lane particularly in that area. But when this property is developed, and if there's not, it's like um, Burke Mountain. Everybody had has one parking lot, and hopefully, f waiting for the bus to come. Don't let that happen for this new developed property, because. They're going to park on the street. Well, thank you very much. I, I guess I have a question for staff because I wasn't here when the Canterbury Lane subdivision happened. But it's just south of, of uh, Wellington Court, so, and there's so a lot of traffic on Wellington Street now. We've been there 14 years, and we've we've loved the fact that David is open now. It's it's but it's brought a lot of cars into our area and two people on two houses on um, um, Mason just above us have motorcycles and they don't always go to bed that early so um, I'm just anticipating what's going to happen because when this property is developed if the property next door to it is developed again that'll complete the circle for the, with seven houses on this side of the property and then when they the next property that's sold will go around the other half and it's going to be chaotic <laughs> and I'm going to miss the deer very much thank, thank you. you thank you so much so I had one question for staff through the chair how many spots per for me? no thank you um, What's the speculation that's happening on Canterbury? What happened on Canterbury? Like, I, I, I wouldn't suspect that any of these um, lots on the right-hand side of Wellington Street would need to park on Wellington Street. So I'm just wondering if anyone has any insights or conjectures about why there would be people parking on Wellington Street from Canterbury Lane. Uh, Mr. McIntyre. Yeah, Your Worship, it, it's been a while since I've been up there. I, I know Carl is up there today. He might have some um, more current observations. Um, certainly when you have a road that's uh, uh, along the municipal boundary and uh, the other side of the municipal boundary is a park, you know, the chances of the road, road being widened and upgraded are very, very uh, remote. Uh, so basically we, what we have is on the Coquitlam side and with this this project here, I understand there will be some widening and, and, uh, and a curb line put in there. As to the parking, um, I guess that would be maybe one of the uh, uh, unintended uh, uh, implications or results when you get into a, a cul-de-sac pattern like this. You've got uh, a, a long street, Wellington, with a series of short cul-de-sacs off it. Um, the um, <clears throat> These are RS3 lots, so they aren't the largest lots. Um, but particularly when you get them grouped around a cul-de-sac bulb, and it's like pieces of pie, it's wedges of pie. You know, it's narrow at the front, it'll accommodate your driveway. It doesn't leave a lot of room for on-street parking around cul-de-sacs. So uh, if you look at Wellington Court to the north and Canterbury Lane to the south, you, you see that condition. Um, these would be front-loaded lots as well. Um, so much of the, the lot frontage is taken up with uh, a driveway access again, so it's, it's, it's reducing or minimizing the on-street parking. Um, my recollection, they've got fairly generous driveway l lengths, and, and you know, that would be a standard. 
Um, there would be uh, two-car garages as well, but uh, uh, what happens on private property is, uh, is uh, sometimes not always the most optimal for parking. So th those would be my, my general observations about what may be happening on that street. Now, Carl, as I said, was up there today, and, and maybe he can uh, comment as well. Mr. Jones. Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, I think that uh, one thing that might cause uh, some of the on-street parking where it occurs to be a little bit more spread out is that there's a couple of transit stops. Uh, along that stretch, uh, which you can't park uh, on five meters on either side of those transit stops. There's actually two community shuttle uh, stops, I think one just north of Canterbury and, and one further up. Um, and as Jim said, that the, um, each of these RS3 uh, homes would have to have two spaces, uh, and if they have a suite, they have to have three. And uh, the houses will be set back from the property line to allow for driveways that will be able to accommodate two more vehicles uh, on those driveway pads. Uh, so the design of the cul-de-sac, the parking, all the parking uh, zoning bylaw for on uh, off-street parking uh, will be uh, fulfilled. And like I said, with the street uh, improvements, uh, the, the modest widening uh, that we could get on Wellington, uh, at the uh, west end of this proposed subdivision would allow for a couple more spaces there as well. Well, thank you. And I just want, wanted to get one more piece of clarification because uh, uh, I, I, I didn't realize, I, I mean, I realized that there was development variance permits and I asked about it, but have we seen the scenario as council? Have we seen the scenario for the six lots or have we just been presented the seven lot option? Just through the councillors, Zerillo, it's uh, the potential subdivision that's being shown with this rezoning file is the, se the seven lots. It's for approximately seven lots. The rezoning is for RS the RS3 from RS2. Thank you. Thank you. Just if you could, um, okay, step forward, go ahead. It's different than last time, I promise. Um, so just a couple of comments for Councillor Zarilla for your benefit. I'd actually encourage everybody from the city and the council to um, come and visit us, come for tea. Um, the park that we all refer to, it's zoned as park. It, it's a forest, to be clear, um, that backs onto the Poco Cemetery. So it's not a park that anybody goes to visit or play. It's trees, it's wild, it's forest. Wild animals live in there. Um, the comments about parking and street parking um, and the comment about Canterbury Lane and um, there being much more down there. As you can see, we're from Wellington Court and we're on a cul-de-sac as well with a, the um, slightly more generous lots. Um, I'll confess that we have five vehicles parked within our property at the front, partly to the graciousness of our neighbour impeding a little bit on our joint um, middle section there. Um, but so with just a little bit more width of a lot, you can get more vehicles there off the street within your own property. Um, I'd ask council to consider um, the option of not having those two properties um, in the new division facing onto Wellington Street, but to mirror Wellington Court that they're backing onto and have all those properties face into the new cul-de-sac so that they, they uh, mirror us. It took me a few minutes to, to process the 1.8 meters from the side of that house to the back of my fence versus the ones that back on have a 7.6 meter um, minimum that they have to have. It's pretty significantly different. And I think the difference for um, the new subdivision versus Canterbury Lane where that was permitted is those two lots that are facing Wellington Street are backing onto uh, um, that large property where the house, they're not backing right onto where there is a house. It makes a significant difference and even if that property was developed and there was allowed to be two houses facing onto Wellington Street on the 1237 Wellington Street address, at least all those houses then would be side by side. They wouldn't be side to back, um, you know, at their options. So I just 
I would just ask Council to consider that as well when we're looking at the number of lots and the size of lots and width of the lots and the concern about the on-street parking, that if you turn those lots and made each lot a little bit wider, that would alleviate some of that problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will assure you, though, that uh, after the close of the, the public hearing tonight, no, no one on Council will be coming to your place for tea. <laughs> we're, we're actually... About, we're, we're, we're prohibited from doing so under under the rules of public hearings. <laughs> Councillor O'Neill. Yes, so, so thank you, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is what the last presenter was just talking about, but I wanted to get clarity in my mind. Um, and, and, and let's look at the um, get back up a bit. The lot that's at the uh, the proposed subdivision, the one that's at the northwest corner there, the one that the the, the northerly one that fronts Wellington. So its side lot setback is is um, is it going to be this um, just that 1.2 meters uh, because it's essentially like a back lot to the lots A and B off on Wellington Court there. Um, so is, I think that's what she's talking about. That that's actually pr quite close. Those lots that are the pie-shaped ones. Um, in the proposed subdivision, they will have much deeper setbacks and be further away from lots C and D above them. But then, but it's, it sounds like the um, I'm not sure about the side lot setback for that northwest lot that fronts on Wellington. Is that only going to be one point something meters, or is it going to be a fair bit deeper because it's essentially the same as a to, to, to the two lots on Wellington Court, A and B, um, it, it, it's, it's like a side lot. It, it should be treated more like a back lot. So I'm getting a nod. Maybe Mr. Mayor or somebody on staff could answer that question. I suspect um, that in lots of circumstances in the city, I can think of one about two houses for me where a back yard backs onto a side yard and the side yard setback is essentially six feet from the backyard fence, but the houses are then uh, obviously 25 feet plus six feet, 30, 31 feet apart minimum. Um, well, let's find out from maybe staff knows the answer there. Okay, Councillor Ms. Tiffany. Thank, thank you, Your Worship. Um, similar to the comments that the mayor just made, um, yeah, 1.8 meters would be the interior side lot setback for that particular lot from that northern property line. Okay, so it wouldn't be the 1.2 that the other ones have. That is correct. Okay, so it would be a bigger side lot. Did you get that? So that would be a bigger setback than the, than the pie shape one, marginally, not, not the full setback that would be if that was a backyard setback, but it would be bigger. Okay. If, I'm, you right. can't, can't do it from there. Um, okay. it's, it's a six, six foot setback instead of a four foot setback. Okay. Um, if I may, uh, the one point, the proposed 1.2 meter interior lot line setback is for the four lots that are furthest east, the irregularly shaped lots. Yes. And um, the setback lines are what you can't encroach into. I, ju I just want to highlight. Um, we don't have the house plans per se, but the actual driveway letdowns on, for the two homes on Wellington have been paired together, and they've been paired together along the interior lot line for those. So that kind of pulls the massing of the homes uh, towards that interior lot line as well. And you also have a 7.6 meter setback uh, that goes to the east as well. Uh, so there is a little bit of space there possible from the actual setback line in terms of where the actual side of the house may be. Good. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? <clears throat> Mayor Stewart, councillors, my name is Michael Warnock and I live at 1237 Wellington Street, directly south for since 1978. Um, before I start, I'd like to uh, uh, echo the, 
uh, concern. Um, you were talking about uh, the traffic on Wellington Street and the congestion on Wellington Street. Um, and one question came was, what causes all this traffic? Well, there's, there is a rush hour, believe it or not, uh, at around 8.30 in the morning, and again around 2.30, when all the mothers up the street are driving their kids down to Irvine Elementary School. So that's, that's the one. And the other thing I have observed in that regard is the C-38 bus is having problems. It has to pull in behind a parked car to, for, because of oncoming traffic, and I'm talking about in front of um, uh, Canterbury Lane right now. Okay. Um, I'm not opposed to uh, the RS3 development. However, I am opposed to uh, the variance and the method that have been used to achieve variance. Um, I'd, oh, uh, I understand there's going to be another hearing uh, where we could talk about the variance. I wasn't planning on talking on this tonight, but uh, if, if I can talk at the uh, hearing to uh, approve the variance, I, I will do it then. Uh, otherwise, I'll do it right now. We certainly can do it now, uh, as we're about. <clears throat> Council will be weighing in on the its thoughts about this proposed subdivision plan, because that that will come back to us at some point, and staff we are essentially wanting to know what we think of it. So, if you have some concerns, will there be a second public can, hearing like this to do that? Um, for the DVP, we'll have a mini public hearing. Essentially, it's a. Well, I'm going to go, go to staff for this. Mr. Clerk, Mr. Gilbert. Okay. Well, Just if there, if there were variances do come forward through a DVP process, it would only occur after 4.3D. So it, there's not a possibility to comment on the zoning at that time because the zoning will have been completed by a 4.3D to this bylaw. We would not uh, typically um, allow variance, uh, develop variance, mini public hearing as you describe it, prior to 4th reading because we would be in that cone of silence yeah. period. So tonight is the last chance we get to speak, to hear from you before okay. we make a decision on the zoning and... Uh, okay, here's the issue. There has been a, a shared property line tree felled illegally on my property line. Okay. Now, I have had discussions earlier on with Brian Craig, the proponent, and um, it led into a very intimidating uh, situation for me. Um, as a result of that, last May, I sent Mr. Craig a letter advising him of his stance legally, in my opinion, and he refused to accept that letter. I went away on vacation uh, the following month, and when I came back, the tree number 149 on the tree survey that Mr. Craig did uh, was felled onto his property. That was a shared tree. So on May 5th, prior to that, I wrote Mr. Craig a letter, and he did not respond. He did not. Uh, it was a registered letter sent to his uh, service address as registered by the city, and uh, he refused to pick it up, and it was returned to me, and I have it here tonight. If he was here, I would deliver it to him. However, I, and I copied that letter to City Hall, and uh, we, uh, so we went from there. Now, if I may, I would like to read that letter to you. It is on file with City, with the Planning Department. Is that possible? I don't uh, see any reason not. Brian Craig, uh, 20277 Mountain Place, Pitt and Meadows, BC. Dear Mr. Craig, on May 1, 2014, we discussed the status of a borderline Douglas fir tree tagged in your tree survey as Terra Pacific number 149. In discussion, you stated that this tree is more than half on your property and therefore you had the right to remove it. Your comment was, I could cut down it any time, I could cut it down tomorrow if I wanted to. 
The city of Coquitlam has advised me that this tree qualifies as a shared ownership tree and that this is a civil matter not within the provisions of the city of Coquitlam bylaw number 4091-2010. The cutting of a shared tree, a shared ownership tree, must have written consent by both owners. And I'm quoting from a court case in the BC Supreme Court, Anderson versus Skender in 1991. I go on to Mr. Craig, please review the safety concerns identified in my arborist report, which is also on file with City Hall and uh, dated December 5, 2013. This report was done by Radex Tree Landscaping and Consulting. It is on file at Coquitlam City Hall, and I have authorized Tom Hawkins to allow you to review it. Yours sincerely, Michael C. Warnock. Now, um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, subsequent to that letter being sent, the uh, tree specifically that uh, the number 150 was felled and is still lying on the ground. Um, so, I am going to take a stand that that tree stump that is still there is still legally a shared ownership and may not be altered. There is also other shared ownership trees on the property line, which I am not at this time going to give Mr. Craig permission to move. So if you could consider those items when reviewing it. So as I said, in summary, um, basically I feel like I've been bullied. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm a little bit upset, but... Uh, no, I, get, I sense that. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you know, of course, that um, we won't officially give any consideration to the dispute you have with your neighbor, um, and we, uh, the city, can't, uh, it, as it was described, it's a civil matter between uh, two adjacent Yes, yeah, so I understand that. Um, but there's some interesting information there. Right. Um, yeah, okay, I just want to give notice that uh, uh, I'm not giving permission for to uh, touch any other shared trees. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. I bet you there's more speakers to this item. This is the infamous Brian Craig. Um, I guess it just comes down to perspective. Okay, I wonder if you could pull the microphone Mike, up. Brian Craig, sorry. Go. Um, comes down to perspective. Sorry, Mike, uh, just the, for the misunderstanding. Um, we obviously had a bit of a dis, uh, misunderstanding with the tree that was seemingly common on our property. Um, Mike identified a safety issue and brought it to my attention. In fact, the tree could blow down on my house. He was concerned about it going down on his. Um, I had the arborist come on the site and identify it. I took this matter very seriously because it's a neighbor and I do care for neighbors, um, absolutely beyond belief. Um, it is a civil matter, but I will identify what rigorous um, pattern I went through to make sure that I was on side. I contacted a registered forester and uh, they said the center core of the tree is the measured point of who owns the tree. Uh, there's about four inches of a tree like this that actually goes on to White Mike Warnock's tree. I did the survey, I got a blown up survey to just find out exactly what it was. As the tree goes up, it actually leans onto my property. So when we did cut it, I cut it exactly on my property. I never went onto his property. I cut it where it was hanging over my property. Um, I want to say that I also got an arborist opinion. The center core of the tree, again, um, is not, there's no such thing as a shared tree except if you plant it together. This is a voluntary tree. Um, I, I checked with my insurer and asked my insurer, well, what's the liability? Um, if you're going to have a tree fall over, um, how do you define ownership? Center core of the tree um, is where the owner of that tree. I then contacted my lawyer and he did a study and went through various um, uh, cases and demonstrated very clearly to me that I was on site in every front. So I proceeded to take action to remove that tree and 
not cross his property, but being kind in that way, when we fell it, it could clearly be demonstrated as it's lying there that it could have hit our house. And my son right now is a tenant in that house. So we fell, we fell the tree that way. So that just removes that issue. That's a different perspective. I'm not arguing against Mike's per se. I'm just telling you what my perspective was. I was trying to be a responsible neighbor. Um, I, and that's my view of how I dealt with the issue. And I dealt with it um, with at least four opinions. And so um, I do want to care for my neighbors. It's not anything different than that. I do want to care for everyone around me. I've been listening to everybody here, and uh, again, being the developer here on this property, um, I do care about all of what you've had to say. I'm very thankful that you've come out. Um, I see 6,000 square foot lots. I have quite a bit of experience in dealing with development, and uh, 4,000 square foot lots are smaller, and I'm used to building on those. 6,000 is a dream. They're quite large. Um, I realize that they're narrow at the front, but that has specific advantages with the extra parking. Um, the, uh, and so I, I see that driveway as being a, a real advantage. Um, the, the, the look we're going for at this point, unless uh, the looks change, is more of a timbered look. It's quite likely we've done subdivisions where when we do fall the trees, we're going to take the trees and probably take them off site, mill them, and then bring back components of it and have heavy timbered houses with the same components. We've done it before and the houses look really sharp and we've had, we've had uh, tremendous response from people when they come by and they look at our, look at our homes. Um, and there is an example of one we did in Pitt Meadows. Um, and you could actually look at four houses we did in a row and we kept the trees around as much as what we could. Now obviously we have to be very wise with what the arborist says and so that we have to um, follow uh, his recommendation for all the issues of safety and whatnot. So, you know, I deliberately worked very, very hard to get seven lots there. And of course, it really does help me as a developer to have seven rather than six. I can guarantee you that the product that we build is beautiful product. I've got a lot of experience, over 30 years of experience, and I'm a registered builder. So not only do we do the land development, but we actually do do the building as well. And uh, um, so you can be rest assured that the product will look nice. It'll be a nice neighborhood. Um, one lady did identify um, one of the neighbors um, in the corner lot, um, and the only thing I could say and add maybe to that, the one, there's a 1.8 meter setback, but I could also say that because those lots, the shape of them, the style of home that's going to go on there, they're not going to have much depth. So when you were actually looking back at the house, you're going to find, first of all, it's going to be quite private. There probably won't be very many windows on that side of the house, so you're going to actually have privacy. And it will work that the house is actually, if you looked at the lot, it's more like, like if you had to, if, you, if the lot shape was like this, you would have, um, the house will be kind of narrow the other way. And so that actually will create, there won't be much bulk or space there. Um, that's just my view. And uh, so that, that has some advantages because you're not actually looking into their rear yard and there's more privacy and you're not looking into one another. And that's just my view as, as a developer that there's a bit of an advantage there. Uh, um, other than that, I, I could only al also say I had some deliberation on this and I chose the narrower, um, the 1.2 setback for those four lots. I had an alternative and I had to make a choice. The other alternative is, is that um, I got a report from my geotechnical engineer based on um, instead of going eight meters on the bank from the from the top of the bank, um, I could go with six meters, and I can accomplish the same thing with a different type of variance. But what I chose was for the side yard variance. So I don't know whether that confuses things or not. Obviously, my application of the side that I decided to go with was a side yard variance, but. Uh, I do have geotechnical support that instead of having eight meters from the bank, um, I could actually have six meters from the bank, the top of bank, and it would be um, completely safe. And that would be towards the SPIA area. And lastly, but not least, this is more of a question than anything because I'm hearing this wildlife corridor thing, and I guess I'm just 
maybe ask staff through the mayor. Um, uh, and I'm uh, just wondering if um, there is supposed to be a fence along the spia, and I don't mind putting the fence there, but I'm wondering if there could maybe be some an odd opening or an offset opening for the for the animals to actually just come through. Um, and I and I, that's what I don't know, but I would be willing to do that if if that allowed the animals to kind of come through um, if that needed to happen. And uh, the only other thing that I would concur is is that I'm more than willing also to do. Uh, a fence along the north side as well, and being cooperative with that too. I, I, I just don't have a problem with that. We we usually do do fences fences around our property, um, so we want to be a cooperative developer. I don't want to cause harm in the neighborhood, and like I said, I was very diligent on my side with what I did, acting with um, with legal counsel and advice as to how I dealt with that tree um, to make sure there was sensitivity there in my actions. And I do all of my actions with extreme caution and sensitivity because of things exactly like what just was read and I'm sitting in front of you and that I have got a position of that I actually was diligent in how I dealt with my neighbor and how I saw it, even though it is a civil matter. I do care about neighbors. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Unless there's any questions. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yeah. yeah, you talk about being sensitive about your neighbors and, and trying to do the right thing. Uh, can you tell us why you didn't respond to his registered letter or ignored be, it? Be, because I never was aware of it. Pardon me? I, I was not aware of it. The registered letter? No. I it didn't come to your house? No. I wasn't aware of it. Um, okay. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see no other questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Now, did that open a can of worms? Are there any other speakers on this item? In a moment, we'll just ask if there's anyone who hasn't spoken yet once. Is there anyone that hasn't spoken before? Anyone at all? Okay. Uh, this isn't a rebuttal of any civil and cross property line disputes that might exist. An answer to your question. An answer to your question. Um, I have the tracking records for that letter, and it was delivered to the service address and held for pit metals at, for ten days and never picked up and returned to me. Okay. So it's possible that someone didn't get the notice, but away we go. Okay. Any other uh, speakers of this item? Any other speakers to this item? A third and final time, or are there any other speakers to this item? Seeing none, I'll declare this item closed. The next item, item four, is an application to amend the zoning bylaw to rezone the property at 1238 Rockland Street from RS2 one family suburban residential to RS8 large, large village single family residential and P5 special park. This is bylaw number 4555. This site is located on the west side of Rockland Street, north of Victoria Drive in northeast Coquitlam. The western portion of the site is designated. There we go. The western portion of the site is designated Baycrest Low Density Residential under the city's official community plan, and the eastern portion of the site is designated environmentally sensitive area. Zoning on the site and in the immediate area is RS2, one family suburban residential. The applicant is requesting rezoning to RS8, large village single family residential and P5 special park to facilitate subdivision of approximately six single family residential lots on the western portion of the site and a streamside protection area on the eastern portion of the site. The proposed zones are in concurrence with the OCP land use designations of Baycrest Low Density Residential and Environmentally Sensitive Area. Staff are recommending all final readings to bylaw 4555. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? Okay. We have the uh, portable mic. Hi. 
Um, sorry. Hello, uh, my name is Victor Leck. I live at uh, 3525 Victoria Drive. Um, that's number 125 on your little map here, where the creek goes through my through my yard. Okay. There you go. Um, I don't have any problem with with changing the uh, the RS8 or whatever. Um, my my concern or un, unconcern perhaps is with the creek. Um, the creek goes through north of that. It ends in what is going to be the city, the new city center. Um, it's like a flat area that is a sponge that allows the creek to run nine months out of the year. Um, when the when that all becomes concrete and pavement, that creek will actually not be running much at all anymore. So that is a park with a creek that won't be. I just don't know why you'd need to call it a park. I mean, if you want to park there, make a park there. That's fine. But it's, if it's for the creek, the creek's not hardly going to be there. Okay. About all I have to say. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Asmundson. So that is considered a non-permanent through the staff and through the non-permanent, non-fish bearing water course in that area. Correct. And staff are going to concur that that's a, it's non-permanent now, so it'll be non-permanent later too, I suspect. Yes, there's, uh, however, there's going to be a, there's a 10 meter streamside protection enhancement area or SPIA uh, around the, uh, uh, the stream, uh, hence the need for the, the culvert crossing. And also further north um, into the northern part of, or central part of Pinion Creek, um, those, uh, the stream area there will also be protected by that. Uh, so it won't be paved over. There'll be the ability for uh, water to be uh, uh, put into that system. Uh, over the year, um, during the wetter months, of course. And there's also a qualified environmental professional who's been retained as a part of this uh, to ensure that there's uh, adequate setbacks. And the planning that's being done north of this, like I said, uh, is taking into consideration uh, the health of the upper reaches of this uh, water course. It does rain a lot, and it will run when it rains. It just won't run too much other than that. Okay, it's still it's still a creek, and we still yeah. have to no, put a riparian I, zone, and I it will be a park. The uh, where my lot is when development comes to my door, I just thought I'd let you know that I will be looking to put that underground, as it is when it crosses into Port Coquitlam. Mm. And we wish you well. Yes, wish you well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. We'll, we'll see how that works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, any other speakers? To Councillor Zarillo. Yeah, I, I had some questions about this uh, subdivision at first reading, and I want to thank um, Carl Johansson for supplying such a, a good follow-up uh, package in regards to the cost of such a development. I had concerns that the cost of um, servicing to this area would have a, would, would burden other taxpayers at this point in time because we didn't have enough density su to support the infrastructure. Um, um, there is a lot of costs associated with it. I just wanted to clarify that staff is confident that the full burden of supplying infrastructure to this semi-remote location right now is going to be borne by the developer and will not have any burden on the current taxpayer as far as putting in new infrastructure, sewers, roads, those sort of things. Through your worship, the Councillor Zarill, that is correct. Okay, and then I also had a question, and I, I'm not sure, just clarification if I read this properly. This is the first subdivision for the Partington Creek Neighborhood Plan? It's fair to say that this is one of the first, but not the first. Um, another significant subdivision that went forward is the PC1, PC2 Westfield subdivision off of Sheffield Avenue. And, uh, and that, that was the one council. that we did recently with all of the retaining walls? That's correct. Uh, the one that's in the, uh, uh, would be just east of the Smiling Creek neighborhood. 
the first phase of uh, development in that area. And this is the first subdivision in the Baycrest area, uh, but there is uh, a number of, uh, um, there's a, I would say there's interest in the Baycrest area that will probably move forward shortly in terms of uh, other applications coming in. Okay, so I did have a question in regards to timing on the on on this this development. Or was there a timeline uh, ever announced to the residents of Coquitlam for when the Partington Creek plan would start to uh, be developed or to heat up? I mean, I'm asking this question because. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're doing it within the capacity of the, the the residents being ready for it. So was there ever timing told to residents that we'd be doing Partington 2015 or it's not coming till 2017? Was there any conversations like that that were ever had in the community? Uh, Your Worship, I'll uh, make a magnet. Try, try to respond to that. Um, not so much like sort of a start date, end date for the plan. In fact, um, and, and this is uh, uh, some of the, the more veteran council members remember that the Pine Creek neighborhood plan was kind of a stop go for a number of years. There was some uh, some issues that surfaced uh, earlier on, so the plan was put on hold. So it, the, the neighborhood plan was only reactivated and completed within the last couple of years. So, um, and it was um, it was early 2014 when the plan uh, finally came forward. Um, and so the neighborhood plan was brought forward to council uh, through by bylaw process, um, and it was adopted. And, uh, and following that, I think it was the understanding was that <clears throat> now that the neighborhood plan was in place, um, development applications would come forward uh, based on that plan. And as Carl mentioned, this is I think the second the second one that we've seen that are in the the part of New Creek neighborhood. This would be the first in the Baycrest area, which is the area sort of lower down uh, in this portion of Burke Mountain. The other one, the uh, PC1, Parting Creek 1, is up north of David Avenue as the school site, and that was earlier in the year for that. So, no, there was no specific start and end dates for the, the, the plan and the development. Okay. And I know on the Sheffield one, I was concerned about the retaining walls and the size of the retaining walls, and I remember at that time mentioning that I'd like to see how it panned out. Is this going to have, this one will not have the same um, slopes and retaining wall necessity coming forward? History of worship at Councillor's Row, this is a relatively flat site. Uh, so the retaining walls uh, that are needed for development in the northern part of Partington where the slopes are more um, pronounced, um, there won't be that kind of uh, retaining walls for this one. Um, there is a creek crossing uh, that will be going through the, the new local road, and there will be a little bit of earthworks there for that, but pretty minor. Okay. And last question has to be about schools. What will be the local elementary school, the local middle school? For this location, um, you, Your Worship, um, currently in this area, uh, there would be uh, Lee Elementary would be further west along Victoria Drive. Um, the planned schools in the area, the the Pardon Creek neighborhood plan had envisioned. Uh, I believe it was uh, up to two elementary and possibly a middle school. Um, is looking like one of those elementary school sites which would be just a little bit to the north of the site and a little further to the east um, would be in time when the full neighborhood builds out would be the closest elementary school. Okay, and what about a middle school? Um, middle school? What's uh, the middle school for this this area? I mean this this will be developed, these houses will be ready to go before the school is so I'm, the elementary will go to Lee, how about the middle school, where will they go? Yeah. Currently, um, in the, the city's official community plan, um, and the school district is keeping their options open, there's, there's a, a number of possible identified middle school sites across Burke Mountain, and, and that's all just being uh, uh, clarified now. Okay. And is there any transit along Baycrest, Victoria Drive, north? Like, is there any transit right now? The one going north? There's transit going north on Victoria Drive? Or lower Victoria Drive? Lower. Okay, so transit would stop at the corner of Victoria and Rockland? Thank you. That's great, thanks. Okay, we'll do it again. Are there any other questions, any other speakers to this item? Are there any others? Please come forward, sir. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm kind of first time coming this kind of meeting, but uh, am I allowed to speak behalf of uh, my friend? Uh, she's the owner. Of you can the... speak on behalf of anyone if you can convince oh, us. That's okay. what you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, she just recently moved into the. Your name and address, though. Oh, you have to okay. give your name. Her name is uh, my name. Your your name, and you okay. can tell us her name too. Okay, my name is uh, Jong Lee. Okay. Uh, she lives in uh, 17. Yeah, 18. She just recently moved in, 18. just a couple of days ago, they moved in. Oh, she lives in lot 18, which is 3540 yes, yes. Crest. Okay. Okay, uh, so her there. main concern is, I don't know how high they're going to build. And uh, so she wanted some, like, a privacy. So between the lot P5 and the 18, are they going to put the fence or a tree there to, to you know, uh, some privacy? Uh, P P5 it will be a wilderness. Yeah, yeah, wilderness. Where are they building the house? We, we, we won't. The RS8 is there? Oh, RS8, okay. So, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm not. I, I wonder if we could perhaps. <laughs> he chaired a meeting earlier today, but he doesn't realize he's not the chair now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, uh, Ms. Tiffany. No? Ms. Ms. Everyone. Mr. McIntyre. <laughs> Take a number. I, I, I just want to confirm. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, the, the address, sir, is 3540 Baycrest? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, do we have attachment three? Is it on the. so that the gentleman can see that? Um, yeah, Baycrest at the top. <clears throat> There's the, the water course that's coming down. It doesn't really show too well. It's just that, that dashed arrowed line. That's where the water course comes down the hill. So 10 meters on either side of that, there'll be a green belt that would be retained to protect the water course. As well as there's a, the BC Hydro right-of-way that cuts diagonally across the back half of your, of your friend's property. Um, that obviously would be undisturbed too. That's the, the transmission line right-of-way. Um, so in, in terms of, of, of the relative location, uh, if this subdivision, if the zoning's supported by council and the subdivision goes ahead, um, you'd have those two areas, those two buffers, the, the, the BC Hydro transmission line right of way plus the, the, the creek corridor as, as, as separations between um, the subject property and your, your, your friend's property. Okay. And just, just to add to that, uh, apologize, I was trying to get oriented there. Um, the, the lot actually to the west of that as well. Um, there's a little bit of a, uh, the northeast corner that touches that, and you have a 7.6 meter uh, setback there as well. Um, and it's likely that um, vegetation there will, will be taking a look at that as well as a part of the, the PLA. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're good. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? The third, and this is the final time, are there any other speakers to this item? I'll declare this item and the public hearing closed. Now we'll take about, a, about seven minutes while staff change tapes and do all the things that have to be done. And we'll start a uh, council meeting at 9.10.